Uh, good morning and welcome to everyone who is here with us this morning. Uh, today's webinar is about CT scans for oral maxillofacial surgery. Uh, my name is Robert Whitaker. I am the business development manager for the United States for Epica Animal Health. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Epic Animal Health, we manufacture and build the most advanced 3D CT imaging platforms in animal health care. Uh, the Bimigo GT30 uh, is our most utilized unit out there today. Our dedication to innovation and engineering has earned us multiple patents, as well as the trust of many well-known research and educational institutions. Leading veterinary hospitals and specialty groups during the last 10 years have purchased a Bimigo. Over 300 progressive veterinary hospitals now use our imaging system and regard the Vimigo GT30 as the new standard of care. I'm joined today uh, by Dr. Ellen Dominic. Uh, she's a veterinarian at Neal Veterinary Hospital in Oklahoma City. Uh, Dr. Dominic comes from uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma today. Is that right? That's right. Okay, fantastic. Uh, she's a 93 graduate of the University of Georgia College of Vet Medicine. Um, she uh, relocated to California for an internship in Sacramento uh, in surgery uh, thereafter. In 1997, she completed her residency in small animal surgery at UC Davis uh, School of Veterinary Medicine and accepted an opportunity to join the small animal surgery faculty at Oklahoma State University College of Vet Medicine. In 1999, she became a board certified veterinary surgeon where she enjoyed teaching and mentoring veterinary students while writing, reviewing, and publishing scientific papers. Developing a passion for complex dentistry and oral surgery, Dr. Dominic was accepted into an alternate track residency program with the American Veterinary Dental College and started Oklahoma State's first dentistry training for veterinary students. Using her specialist training and experience in dentistry, Dr. Dominic has been selected to speak at dental conferences throughout the United States. Today, she continues to practice emergency, surgery, and dentistry in private practice and is a surgeon consultant for dentistry. She remains a devoted Bulldog fan, although Oklahoma is now home with her family, two dogs and two cats. So before we get started, uh, I need to take care of a couple of housekeeping items right quick, Dr. Dominic, excuse me. Sure. Um, so this talk is approved for one hour of CE credit and qualified, uh, all qualified attendees will receive their certificates uh, yeah. sometime next week. Um, there will be a survey with five questions that will run after this webinar. Uh, your answers are required uh, to determine your eligibility for race credits. Uh, this webinar is recorded, and we will provide a link at a later time uh, for you to utilize uh, for review. You're more than welcome to submit your questions through the Q&A box, but we won't be able to answer until the end of this webinar when the Q&A session opens. So without further ado, Dr. Dominic, uh, you're on. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Okay, well, today what I want to do is present a few cases, uh, very cases, about how CT has helped me um, with my oral maxillofacial surgery. So basically anything dentistry, head and neck. And so let's get started. Again, here's my UGA. Uh, so um, go dogs. And so the first thing you want to talk about is... Um, the CT and what are some of the limitations um, or how it helps me in my practice. So the first thing is helps me with giving a client prognosis. If I know, for example, the extent of a maxillofacial trauma or the extent of a tumor, it's gonna help me give that owner a better prognosis than I would without really advanced imaging. As I just said, surgical planning as well. Um, if I know that there are multiple fractures or the tumor is more extensive, for example, then it's going to help me uh, really help with more complex surgery planning. Um, and then pre predicting the outcome. Um, the CT, thank you. My coffee arrived. Um, 
So predicting the outcome, um, you know, when I have the uh, very good high resolution images, I'm going to know more, uh, more completely what the outcome is going to be. Um, what I found was with, with our new CT, um, that our resolution is just phenomenal. You know, I've never been able to see fractures. Or I've never been able to really uh, look, at, look at masses and tumors quite as well. They're, again, the resolution is just amazing. And um, we use, you know, I, we actually have CT'd um, exotic pets, guinea pigs, uh, small pocket pets, all the way up to, you know, Great Danes and full body. So it's it's been a wonderful, um, wonderful addition. And the other, uh, the most, one of the most, one of the most um, exciting things is the contrast enhancement. When I'm looking at soft tissue, when I'm looking at muscle, when I'm looking for lymph node um, metastasis, then I'm going to be I'm going to be really looking for that contrast enhancement. And the cone beam CT does not have that, so it's it, it is a limitation. And it's pretty fast. We can get a head CT or we can get a whole body CT in just a few minutes to under 20, 30 minutes. And we like the fact too that the radiation is, is relatively low. Mm -hmm. Limitations, there are a few limitations um, for dentistry. Um, of course, one of the problems we have or one, one of the obstacles we have are, are, are the anesthesia, um, it does require sedation or preferably general anesthesia. Um, in some cases, we have to do breath holding. And there is a little uh, an, a higher cost than just the x-rays. But what I'm going to get to is what that tells us and what that gives us as far as information and outcome is worth every penny um, that we spend on it. Okay, the first case is bear. And Bear is an eight-year male neutered Shih Tzu. He presented recently to our emergency service and the owner said his bottom teeth are sticking out more than normal. And the owner was concerned that, quote, something was wrong with his jaw. Well, I have Shih Tzus and I know that their bottom teeth always stick out more than normal. So I was going, okay. Um, but we took a look at him. He had also a four-week history of pain, off and on pain. The referring veterinarian had given him a series of antibiotics, pain medications, anti-inflammatories. He responded somewhat, but still was not eating really well and acting himself. So we did a workup. Um, we did a heart room test, was negative. Your analysis showed an elevated protein, fairly high, a low urine specific gravity. This ECG was normal sinus rhythm. Chemistry showed quite an elevated creatinine, 5.7. The UN was elevated at 119, and this phosphorus was 16, and that was with dilution. So we knew that this was, was pretty serious. Uh, we went ahead and did imaging um, because we knew that his jaw was very mobile and that he was in a lot of pain. And what we found on the digital dental right fracture, which you can see right here, and on the other side, a pathologic left uh, mandibular fracture. The rostral mandible, the symphysis was basically non-existent. Um, palpably, you could wiggle it and it was very, very mobile. But you can see that real severe cortical thinning and that severe loss of alveolar bone. Uh, proceeded to a CT, which really showed us not only with the, the mandible and maxilla, but the entire skull had a profound loss of bone density. And you can see the left maxillary or the mandibular uh, pathologic fracture, but just minimal bone. And let's show you the movie here. We're gonna give you a full win movie, but you can just see that just, it's just profound, the loss of bone. Okay, then we went and did a, a sedated oral exam. Uh, and what we found was that he had multiple missing teeth. On my dental chart, the circles indicate teeth that are missing. And the 
mobility of the mandible and maxilla were just, again, pretty astonishing. It was literally like rubber bones. Symphysis was quite mobile. Um, and all of the remaining teeth were quite mobile. Mobile three means that they move in all directions. And um, this, the surprising thing was, if you look at the numbers in the boxes, these little numbers here, those are the periodontal pockets. And those really weren't too deep. So we really didn't have periodontal disease as such. We had severe bone loss. So assessment, rule outs. Could this have been just simple periodontal disease? I really don't think so. Um, when we see periodontal disease, we usually see really focal vertical bone loss or horizontal bone loss or both confined to the alveolar bone or the, the sockets. And we didn't see that this was more extensive. Neoplasia, not really anything I could come up with that would explain this. And so that left me with the pathologic bone disease. Primary hyperparathyroidism could be um, a rule out, but that's, that is pretty rare in dogs, and we didn't really have an indication of that. Secondary hyperparathyroidism can be nutritional or renal. So let's look at nutritional. Typically, what we think of is a malabsorption syndrome. And in this case, the intestines are normally the source of calcium absorption. So the kidneys in secrete calcitriol to promote calcium absorption and vitamin D absorption from the intestines. And in this case, if, um, if this is a low, if there's a malabsorption syndrome, then there's a lack of absorption of the calcium from the intestines, including and vitamin D into the bloodstream. In that case, PTH or parathyroid hormone will increase, causing calcium to be released or resorbed from the bones. So we typically see an, a very elevated parathyroid hormone, a low vitamin D level, a low ionized calcium, and a low normal or a normal or a low phosphorus. So this didn't really fit with Bayer. Renal secondary, hyper, uh, the pathology is that the kidneys are failing or not working. They're unable to in, uh, secrete calcitriol to promote calcium absorption and vitamin D absorption from the intestines. So in this case, the PTH again is elevated and causes bone re uh, resorption of calcium from the bone. So we see an elevated PTH, we see a low vitamin D, low calcium, just as in the other, but the phosphorus is typically very high. And as the phosphorus increases, it still stimulates the PTH to uh, even more and it causes more resorption. So this was our diagnosis with Bear. So what were our treatment options? Well, we could treat him, first of all, for the renal disease or probable renal failure. We need to promote renal uh, diuresis, promote urine production, reduce that creatinine in the BUN with IV fluid therapy, and even peritoneal dialysis need be. The other thing is to use phosphorus binding medications to reduce the phosphorus so that that will cause homeostasis of the phosphorus and calcium. Um, the looking at the teeth themselves, would it be possible to extract all the teeth? And the answer would be no. Uh, even though they probably would have fallen right out with this severe loss of the, of the cortical bone, alveolar bone, I probably would have caused more fractures and really not solved any problem. Stable of, stabilization of the mandible, uh, there really was no bone left to use any stabilization device, whether it be bone plate, wiring, anything like that. So very poor prognosis there. Um, so talk to the owner, and I think we, um, the owner made a right decision because of not only the renal disease and not knowing the significance of that, but also addressing the dog's ability to eat. Um, they elected euthanasia. So, and. One thing looking back, we talked about yesterday was, could I use a CT scan when I CT'd his head? And the answer is yes. And we can use a CT scan for a wellness exam for the kidneys. And we're gonna be looking at the blood flow, the vasculature and the architecture. So let me show this movie clip. 
So I learned a lot from this as well. Let's see if this is going to work. May not be working. Well, I think Robert, I'm not going to get that to work. Maybe if you press your space bar. Okay. No. Yeah, maybe it's just locked up. I don't okay. understand. Okay. So, and let me go back up. There we go. Okay. So, do you want to uh, say anything about this right here, just from the still picture? Yeah, yeah. certainly. Um, so, what this is is, you know, there's been some discovery of, uh, you know, utilizing contrast, um, iohexol contrast, to evaluate kidney function uh, in canine and feline patients. And the way this is done is with a serial CT scan right over the kidneys uh, during the delivery of the contrast bolus. Uh, we're scanning and then we wait two minutes and we scan again and then we wait an additional two minutes. So four minutes post contrast delivery, we scan a third time. Um, and we get to go through all of the um, data sets on these three scans and compare how the kidneys are eliminating uh, the contrast material. And if you look in that right kidney, um, um, if you would put your mouse over the right kidney, please. Uh, over here, yes. Uh, you'll see some dark spots in there. And if you look at the opposite in the left kidney, there's no dark spots. So you can mm -hmm. see clearly that we've got a diseased kidney. Guess what? This patient um, was not clinical and this patient was not showing any um, signs of kidney disease on labs. So this is becoming more and more predictive of kidney disease using, you know, the, the more we do it and the more papers we get written on it, it's going to become common practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, this, even the, in an ultrasound, we can certainly uh, ascertain vasculature and blood flow to some extent, but this is just, you know, even a more, uh, a, a more descriptive modality. So this is, this is neat. So this is something I'm going to bring back to the hospital. Okay. Hey, let's go to our next case. This was Trip. He was a five-year-old male neutered, neutered lab, uh, healthy as could be. Um, his owner is a veterinarian here in town, and she had previously removed a tumor from the right rostral maxilla centered at 104, or in the upper right canine tooth, about three months earlier. And she also had removed the adjacent teeth, extracted those as well. And so an incisional biopsy was performed. She didn't think she got a clean margin. She didn't get too aggressive. She did send it in for histopath, which confirmed an amyloblastoma, which is an odontogenic tumor. And when uh, she spoke to me, she said it was really unusual because the mass itself was cystic. It felt, um, instead of solid there, it was very cystic in, in structure. Okay, lab work um, was basically all normal, heartworm negative. He did have a, a typical sinus arrhythmia that a healthy lab would have, so everything checked out fine. And this shows the, um, I don't think this is our movie. Oopsie. This is a 3D reconstruction of um, the, right, uh, the right maxilla and mandible. I went straight to CT on this dog. I didn't think dental radiographs were going to help me at all, so we went straight to this so I could really look at the extension of the tumor. What you see here that really hits me are these kind of Swiss cheese looking holes, these, uh, these cystic structures which fit with the previous reports. But you can really see the amount of bony destruction here. Um, you can see from 106, 105, 104 are missing. So we can go on and we looked at two dimensional pre and post contrast. Um, what I could see here was just really the extensiveness of this or the expansion of it into the nasal cavity on the coronal view. And you can see the little cystic structures to it and the bone destruction. On the transverse view, again, you can see really where it was uh, invading and really again, making these cystic type of structures. What was good news is it didn't cross the, the synthesis or the, the septum. 
And here's with contrast enhancing, you can really, really help to see even more the cystic nature of it and the expansiveness of it. So um, contrast for me is very helpful and it lets me know exactly where I'm going to, to make my um, osteotomies, okay? So again, here's a, a color changes. Here's a, a reconstruction with the density and 3D density. And what we have here is Robert explained, the wider it is, the more dense it is. And the color is not, the color changes just mean changes in density. So where the tumor was centered, you can see the red and the dark area, the darker it is, the less dense it is. So quite profound and quite destructive. Okay, and then we have another view of this. So we're just basically taking away tissue here. You can see the vasculature and you can really see the cystic, cystic areas of it as we go through this. So the, the uh, density rendering is, is amazing. Let's go to the next one. So uh, on the Sonopath report, uh, it confirmed an expansile multicystic mass with the right rostral maxilla. Measurements were about four by three by three centimeters. Intranasal expansion, but no, uh, um, it did not go through the nasal septum and, and the maxilla synthesis. Multiple osteolytic defects and expansion of the alveolus around 103. So I knew that this was growing, it was extending into the incisive bone. Okay, so now I had to determine about my surgery treatment. Um, one of the current concerns was invading into the nasal cavity. Uh, because it was cystic material, sometimes that can stick to the nasal mucosa or the turbinates and you want to be able to remove all that cystic material or you could have recurrence. And the other concern would be to remove the turbinates or not. When you're doing nasal surgery, uh, you, you have to really remove all the turbinate tissue if you're going to, otherwise you'll have a lot of hemorrhage. And the other concern was, would I be able to get a complete excision? Uh, I wasn't really worried about it as far as the palatal area and, and the nasal cavity, but dorsally, um, and the maxillary bone and extending up into the buccal tissue, I wanted to make sure I was going to have dorsally and buccally clean excision if possible. So I did not get a CT after, which I shall do, but this, uh, I did use dental radiographs to show uh, my osteotomy lines. I look for that to make sure there are no rough edges to make sure that none of the alveolar bone or teeth and dental tissue is compromised from the osteotomies. You can see here um, that I left some alveolar bone. And on this one, I went ahead and initially left the, the uh, incisor, but I could see I was awfully close. So I went ahead and took that and took out the periodontal ligament so that we would have uh, better margins. So the SOPA report, this is the, um, the, I use them, I use Dr. Bell the, uh, for, my, on, for my histopath, and she confirmed that um, on the gross tissue that there was expansion of the maxillary bone, and she said when she opened up the bone that the neoplastic tissue or the cystic tissue bulged out. The microscopic diagnosis was, again, odontogenic tumor, uh, PDL or periodontic lig ligament tissue, um, and it was producing amyloid. It did fit a canine amylo acanthomatous amyloblastoma, except typically they're solid and they don't produce amyloid. So her concerns, my concerns are, although my bony margins and soft tissue margins were technically clear, um, that there was cystic tumor that was opened or maybe ulcerated along some of the margins, which could be a source of recurrence in the, in the future. So we'll keep an eye on, on trip here. Case number three, Penny. She was a feisty 10 year old female spade, Jack Russell. And um, she had a propensity for picking fights with her 50 pound housemate. They had been in a few fights over the last few months. And the fights were escalating from just bite wounds and 
this time she sustained a left mandibular mandibular fracture. And the photo just shows the separation here in the gingival tissue. We did the uh, initial lab work workup, thoracic radiographs, just to make sure there wasn't any unseen internal trauma. They were fine. Lab work showed an increased ALKFOS, which could be from uh, hepatopathy because of her age. Blood glucose was slightly elevated from stress. Potassium was slightly elevated, probably from cell damage, and a lymphopenia, which would be a stress leukogram. Her ECG was normal. Okay, so school radiographs, and our emergency doc took these before I saw her and took some uh, lateral views, dorsal views. And you can see here, you can see basically a little bit of a fracture line here. You can see a fracture line on this second view. Um, you can see on the other oblique view, you can, uh, you can see it barely. On the VD view, again, you can see some, but it really didn't tell me a whole lot. Um, back in the day, we this is all we had to use, so we didn't really know until we got into surgery, you know, what we needed to fix. And it tells me nothing about any concurrent trauma. We did dental radiographs, and you can see they, they were nice to show us the trauma to the molar here. So 310, alveolus was disrupted, and the displacement. And so we actually then went to our CT scan. And this was helpful because I wanted to look for any additional fractures. I wanted to see if there was any periodontal disease that would affect or um, compromise my fracture repair and any other dental or other uh, abnormalities that would uh, affect my fracture repair and my treatment for Penny. And luckily she just had the, the one left mandibular fracture. Let's take a look here. And so what I'm looking for when I, when I do a reconstruction, I'm looking for any orbital fractures, oftentimes they're bitten on the maxilla and I'll see sinus fractures, I'll see periorbital fractures, I'll see maxillary fractures. And luckily in Penny's case, everything was clean. Let's go, okay. So how was I going to treat her? So as far as surgical options, we did need to stabilize this. It, the, mandible, the mandible makes a long lever arm, so it is important to stabilize that. It, we do wanna go with a minimally invasive type of repair. So one option would have been a bone plate, and I've used small bone plates on the mandible before. I'll lay them um, on the ventrolateral aspect of the mandible. Um, Contraindications are that she had healthy periodontal tissues, and so I didn't want to disrupt or compromise her tissues by making an approach to the mandible. Um, and really, it's overkill in a lot of situations because the mandible heals relatively quickly. And one of the most compelling reasons is there are tooth roots there. And the last thing we want to do is put screws into a tooth root, um, causing pain uh, devitalization of the teeth. And in her case, the fracture was so minimally displaced that really we didn't need rigid fixation with a bone plate. Um, and so one thing I love about fixing the mandible is that remodeling will take place. And even if they're minimally displaced, they'll remodel and heal quite nicely. There are reports of using an IM pin into the, uh, the mandibular canal. If you look at the mandible from a ventral aspect on from lateral to lateral, it's very narrow. And in a, so in a lateral, uh, in a sagittal direction, and a great part of the mandible is filled with neurovascular structures. So the, the mandibular artery vein and the mandibular nerve. So that is not a good option at all. Um, so typically what I'll use is some kind of configuration with a splint, an interdental splint and wires, and or I'll use a circumvential wire. So looking here, an interdental splint would just encompass wiring or fixing wires around the gum line and tightening those up and really 
rigidly or really causing those to line up nicely. And then I follow up with covering that with a layer of a resin. Um, it is actually comes out of a cartridge and hardens and you can shape that into a, a covering. The other way that you can configure the wires would be to have them go around the inside or the lingual and the buckle aspect of the mandible. And you can have them either exiting at the teeth dentally, or you can have them exit under the, under the chin. So this is what I did with her. Um, it, what I'm looking for in my repair is I need to stabilize a fracture. I need to maintain or reestablish dental occlusion. And I want to try to align the fracture edges as best as possible. Later down the line, if there's any dental damage, then I'll go ahead and I'll extract teeth or do root canals, whatever I need to do. But initially, I'm going to just address the fracture. So let's take a look. And you can see my wires. I have some coming caudally and some rostally. And even though we don't see the soft tissue here, they are exiting underneath her chin. I placed buttons up and cinched them against her skin and then placed more of the resin over the buttons to, to really tighten those. So it's almost like a bolo tie, if you will, or a tourniquet. And then I'll go ahead and let me go back one more time and I'll add some resin over the teeth and they're incorpor incorporating wire as well. And so, and I'll smooth that down so that she'll be able to bite down completely. Okay, so here are dental radiographs. Post-operatively, you can see I um, got okay alignment. There's definitely the cortex is, is malaligned somewhat. And at eight weeks, you can see a really beautiful callus was forming and it's remodeling and we're going to have good alignment. And this is right before I removed the wires. And here is the CT image at eight weeks. And we see that the alignment has really lined up and the wires are, are tight. There's no lysis, there's no mobility of the wires, no evidence of any infection. And her occlusion is excellent. You can see rostrally, she's got excellent occlusion and caudally. So I was really happy with her um, outcome there. Okay. Case four is Teary. Teary was an eight year old female spade domestic short hair cat. She was referred to us for a firm bony mass on the lateral aspect of her right mandible. Her veterinarian had given her several weeks of Depomedrol, I believe, or prednisone um, inje in injections and Clavamox, and there had been no change in uh, Terry's outcome, so sent her over to me. La again, lab work was boring. Um, she had a little bit of an elevated blood glucose from stress, slight lymphopenia from stress. ECG was normal sinus rhythm everything was um, within normal. So went straight to our CT scan here, and I have the pre-contrast on the left and the post on the right. What I really, really loved about this is I could see that in this case, this mass was not impinging on or destroying the, the uh, cortex or the cortical bone here. And it really was sitting on top, kind of like a little hat. So that really helped with my surgical plan. I didn't really see any bony lysis or bony destruction. The other thing on the right with the contrast, you can see quite well, really vividly, the adjacent the lymph nodes that drain the head and face and the salivary glands and the vasculature. So that really helped me give a good prognosis for her. And again, we have our 3D reconstruction. You can really see with the contrast how that helps you look at the, the salivary glands and lymph nodes, the um, adjacent vasculature. So I was really pleased to say that these were all normal. So why did I, what would I have done if I just had dental radiographs? The problem with them are sometimes getting the sensor in the very back of the mouth, particularly in a small, patient such as a cat. So I had a really hard time positioning this in a uh, 3D type of position and to really look at the mass. And you can see that you can 
you can tell somewhat where it is, but you really don't see a lot of resolution between the mass and the mandible itself, particularly right here. So I really could not say from this view if this if I needed to remove the entire mandible or not. So went back and reviewed the CT scan. And the advantage, again, is I could look at the mandible. I could look at that caudal aspect of it from any view. I could look at the thickness. I could look at her bone and soft tissue. And I had much, much better resolution. So, and here we're going through. And let's look at the 3D reconstruction. And again, you can see the mass. And even though it's adhered to the bone, it really is not compromising the mandible, it's mandible itself. Okay. Okay, so what were my differentials? First differential was osteoma. Osteomas can um, arise from the cortical bone or the cancellous bone. Another differential was an ossifying fibroma. Third would be an exotosis from a previous trauma or a previous infection, let's say hit by car, dog bite, cat bite, something like that. Osteochondroma or a periosteal osteochondroma. All of these were considered to be benign. benign. Okay. So looking at the CT, my options were, would I need to do a segmental mandibulectomy? In other words, would I need to remove that entire segment of the mandible? I didn't really want to do this because cats don't do really well with that. Uh, the mobility that results from the mandible, the uh, effect on the occlusion, and just their ability to, or their comfort grooming and eating is, can be a problem for cats. A dorsal rim mandibulectomy is somewhat the same, but we actually maintain one of the corte the cortices, let's say the ventral cortex, to maintain rigidity of the mandible. And the third option would be to debulk. I hate that word, but basically a conservative excision um, just to actually um, debride that from the mandible. As far as approach, um, in humans, they use an intraoral approach, and that is, of course, primarily because of aesthetics. If you make an incision into the mucosa, you're not going to have a skin, um, a skin uh, incision, a scar. In our pa veterinary patients, really an extraoral approach or a skin incision was going to really give me better approach and be better visibility. So... What I ended up doing is I made an extra oral approach and I basically just took a burr and took a series of, of instruments and debrided this and scraped it until I could see quote normal uh, mandible and closed it. So I was really happy with um, the end outcome here. And you could still see there's probably a little bit of osteoma or periosteal reaction here. But all in all, I was very, very happy with, with that outcome. So let's look at osteomas. Uh, as in this case with Terry, the owner noticed a firm swelling, typically at the mandible. Um, these can grow. They will grow and grow. And if they get too big, they will interfere with eating or opening the mouth or grooming. There is no breed predilection in cats. Um, these are not typically old cats, uh, mean age is nine years, which is close to teary. Um, one of the characteristics of an osteoma is the bone continues to grow, 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 grow. Um, they can, as I mentioned, can be, uh, can originate from the cortical bone or the cancellous bone. Any of the facial bones can be affected. Um, there are reports of osteomas on long bones as well. Some pathologists and uh, clinicians debate whether this is actually a true neoplasm um, because of the demine, benign nature of it. So it's considered by some people just to be an exostosis. So in this case, in the right situation, debulking or conservative excision can be a real viable option. So uh, I think right now she's doing very, very well and um, we're not showing any evidence of 
regrowth at about eight months and um, she's very comfortable. Okay, last case, Molly. She was a six-year-old female spade domestic short hair. She presented because she'd been eating less for about three days. Um, in a retrospect, the owner said it may have been longer, but really quit eating. The owner also noticed blood dripping, blood tinging um, from her mouth for several days. The owner also noticed an ocular discharge from her left eye for about two weeks. And she didn't think much about it. She thought maybe she had a cold. So she presented on our emergency service for a possible tooth abscess. And whenever I see a cat with a very large swelling, I know that it's not a tooth abscess. It's rarely a tooth abscess. Uh, the emergency doctor noted that the left maxilla was very firm, very swollen, very tender. Lab work again was performed, elevated globulin, which would indicate an inflammatory response. Her feline leukemia FIV test was negative, her ECG normal sinus rhythm, and everything else looked like a healthy cat. Dental radiographs were taken. One thing that I would like to show you here, and I'm gonna pull this away here, is what you can see as far as resolution, you can see the 100 arcade or the upper right, 104, 106, 107, 108, 109. And look at the tremendous loss of density or alveolar bone, really diffuse on the left maxilla. So you can tell to some extent that th this is, a pretty destructive type of lesion. And looking at the rest of her mandible and maxilla, everything was within normal for her age. She did have some early tooth resorption occurring. Okay, what school radiograph show? Well, I was gonna take this out and, but they show nothing. <laughs> they um, really, because of that three dimension, because of the complexity of the skull, because of the structures, they really do nothing for me as far as any type of prognosticating or giving me a surgical uh, probability. So again, here we show our pre-contrast CT. And you can see quite nicely here, you can see the disruption of the palatal bone. You can see um, invasion into the sphenoid sinus here. Uh, and really the loss of the turbinates, you really can't visualize them. On the transverse, you can see a little bit um, where we're starting to get pressure on that left eye, the left globe. In other words, it's, in, it's infiltrating and pushing up on that left eye. And then on the coronal, you can see that the septum's basically intact, but you can see really the extensive nature and the destruction of the maxilla. There, we'll run through that. And this is the type of thing, uh, type of image you see when you go, oh no, it never stops. Okay, post-contrast administration. So that was very, very helpful. You can really see um, how the contrast enhanced. You can see the destructive nature again. Um, you can see really the expansive nature of it, and then really the, the destruction of the palate and the maxillary bone. So, and you can see the displacement on this view of the, uh, of the globe. And we'll go back here. Okay, so sonopath report concluded that the nasal passages on the left side represented a neoplastic process such as lymphoma or squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, definitely confirmed that there was lymphadenopathy on the left side. And this is quite useful because if a pet does have very strong contrast enhancement or lymphadenopathy, I assume that it is metastasized. And I'll use this in my staging to decide whether to go to surgery. Uh, the gas pocketing with those maxillary molars on the left side of molars was actually secondary to destruction rather than periodontal disease. And so that was interesting to me. 
and then the effect or the infiltration into the sinus. So um, I did an incisional biopsy and it did confirm a squamous cell carcinoma. This was an inflammatory squamous cell carcinoma because there was a large population of lymphocytes, plasma cells, neutrophils, macrophages, large, large number of mitotic figures. So it was a very angry tumor. And as I unfortunately knew, it is the most common oral neoplasia in cats by far. Uh, it is very, very destructive, very aggressive, uh, poor prognosis, results in regional destruction. I um, mean, typically it's very uh, late. It metastasizes late. It has a low metastatic potential. But what I'm seeing in these cats, um, particularly such as Molly, by the time they get to see me and the, the um, tumor is so large and advanced, then it will, it will have metastasized. And that was the case with her. Okay, so treatment options for Molly. Well, we had almost certain lymph node metastasis. And of course, the next step would have been to obtain a lymph node. We had invasion into the sinus and clinical destruction of the maxilla and the palate and the orbital bones. So surgery was not an option, unfortunately, for her. I've looked at some lit reviews, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, um, our uh, very dismal uh, outcome, out outlook for those. We really don't have anything on the radar that's going to be helpful for these cats. Um, so our, uh, the only option would be to be palliative care. I typically will face esophagostomy tubes in these cats and pain medications um, to keep them comfortable as possible. And uh, usually it's a, a, a pretty poor quality of life later on. So that is that. So Uga again on the left, got pistol on the right. So. Excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, this is the time uh, in, in our webinar now that, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to take your questions. Uh, if you want to uh, pose a question to uh, Dr. Dominic uh, about any of the cases, you can go to the chat box and uh, enter your question there. Um, of course, if you do have questions about, uh, you know, the CT equipment uh, and how she uses it, uh, she can also answer those, and of course, I can answer technical questions uh, pertaining to the machine and the images it produces. Uh, so any questions right now, please go ahead and, uh, you know, get those into the chat box for us, please. Okay, so I don't see any other questions. Um, I think we can go ahead and wrap this up. And um, thank you so much, Dr. Dominic, for making time to do this. Uh, and uh, thank you for all who attended uh, for making the time to, uh, to come in and, and listen and watch this presentation. Again, we'll have uh, this recording published uh, and sent to the email of everyone who was in attendance so that you can have this link uh, to go back later. And of course, uh, stay tuned for the, um, for the five questions uh, to be answered so that you can get your CE. And I'll wrap it there and give it to you, Victoria. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much, Robert. And uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Dominic, for putting this presentation together. It was absolutely excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Yep. Wonderful. And Robert, yep, you went over everything. The survey will go out. So we'll go ahead and end the webinar. I'll send over a recording later today. And then um, you'll get your CE credit as soon as we receive race approval from AAVSD. So we'll make a formal announcement online when it's available, but we'll also send you an email to the email that you registered with in order to get your CE certificate. So thank you so much for everyone who joined and have a wonderful day.